So welcome to our viewers. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today, Building a Data Lakehouse Service in Sovereign Cloud. Joining us today are Chuck Eistoke, VP Data Greenplum, Guy Bertram, Senior Director of Product Marketing from VMware Cloud, and Neil Stobart, CTO at Cloudian. So welcome, Chuck, Guy, and Neil. Before we begin, I want to point out to those who have just joined us that we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar. So please enter any questions that arise in the question tab on the bottom of your screen. With that, I will hand over to Guy. Okay, thank you very much, Tanya. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is uh, Tanya said is Guy Bartram. I'm a uh, director of product marketing in VMware. Um, and we've already covered this, the housekeeping items. So uh, if you have a question, please use the question button as Tanya explained. And there's also a whole load of download attachments. So you can grab all of the, uh, the details behind this. So I'm going to start talking about um, Sovereign Cloud, and then uh, we're going to uh, pass over to Jacques to talk about um, Green Plum and the uh, Data Lakehouse solution. And then Neil will talk about Cloudian, but we might jump around a little bit depending where the conversation goes. So guys, please feel free to ask questions um, and we'll address them as, as they come. So let's start with Sovereign Cloud. Why Sovereign Cloud? Why is this becoming more and more important? Um, well, when you look at the, the data rate changes uh, that we've seen, which average around 30% year on year, and particularly data, unstructured data, which is becoming harder and harder to manage. Um, and where you look, when you start thinking about where that data actually is, uh, I think the stat is like over 80% of European data is actually held on US soil. Um, and this is primarily due to the fact we've all used the, the convenience of hyperscale cloud providers. Um, and now that they, they are very, very well established, there is a, um, a misbalance in terms of platform ownership. So we have you know, huge hyperscale providers delivering services in and around the world in all different regions. But there is very much a lack of any similar hyperscale capability in EMEA and APJ, especially in EMEA. If you, if you imagine those hyperscale clouds as kind of, you know, footballs, you've got, you know, your Google, your AWS, your Azure, and then if you imagine the European kind of um, equivalent of hyperscaler, maybe someone like OVH Cloud, um, literally possibly the size of a marble in comparison to the, the platform and the consumption of those hyperscalers. So a big distortion um, and a big focus on data uh, has really uh, happened in EMEA over the last few years. We've seen um, you know, GDPR, for example, um, be uh, introduced in EMEA and applicable globally uh, if you hold any personal information on European citizens. And that has also kind of led to more focus on how do we protect our data. And, you know, data is uh, becoming very essential to our economies. Uh, data is where the growth area is. And who really has control over your data? And that's what we call uh, jurisdictional control. So, you know, 42% of um, enterprises, according to this uh, IDC survey we did, um, are particularly concerned about jurisdictional control of their data. And jurisdictional control is slightly different to residency. Uh, residency is just kind of where your data resides, whereas jurisdictional control is where your data resides and who has legal access to it. Who can, um, you know, overwrite local legal laws potentially. Um, and that's a big, big factor when you start looking at putting your data into hyperscale because hyperscale uh, cloud providers are US cloud providers and they're subject to the US Cloud Act. This means basically, even if your data is hosted in I don't know, the UK or France or somewhere in, in a hyperscale data center, it is actually under US jurisdictional control, not French or English jurisdictional control. And that's um, you know, really important when you start looking at how the business models are innovating and how 
data which is central to those those business models and new economies is being utilized if you think about if you wanted to um, deliver ai and ml services to do those types of services you need a large amount of data to teach the uh, machine learning algorithms about the data and how to learn and that means you're going to have to go where the data is which means you're going to have to end up in a hyperscaler cloud um, and basically any ai and ml you condition in there is going to be using the functions that are available from the hyperscaler not necessarily innovative new functions that you might want to design yourselves so jurisdictional control is a, a big point the other one obviously geopolitical changes we've seen a, a, a large change in european political um geopolitical landscape recently with the war in ukraine with the energy crisis which is affecting everyone globally um, and these are becoming more and more concern for businesses, um, particularly when you look at things like supply chain. Um, you know, where is my data residing is one. Who has ownership of my data is two. Uh, let's consider the, the ESG, the enterprise, uh, environment, social and governance factors of that data. Um, when you look at running your stuff in someone else's data center, uh, you are um, attributing the responsibility of the energy consumed by you to the cloud provider. So there's a lot of focus now on what cloud providers can deliver to me in terms of um, uh, transparency around my energy usage. And that's becoming more and more important when we start looking at you know, in renewable energy strategies and, and carbon commitments in the world that we live in today where energy is, cost of energy is rising. Um, there is you know, real concern about the transparency of the energy that you're using from cloud providers and how that affects your supply chain. You know, a lot of companies are advertising, um, you know, uh, renewable energy strategies. And to do that, they need to have complete visibility of um, their supply chain or around greenhouse, greenhouse gas protocol. Um, but also their suppliers and customers are asking for this information as well. It's becoming more important to provide it. So geopolitical changes, Again, um, a very big concern. We've seen instability. We've seen what instability looks like with COVID, with the war in Ukraine, with the energy crisis, and that is concerning businesses. And the last one is confidential data. So really um, understanding what your data is uh, and your responsibilities around your data. As I said before, data growing approximately 30% year on year, the confidentiality of where your data is, what type of data you're actually storing, and um, whose data it is, what, you know, who, uh, what information does it contain, is critical. Particularly when you start looking at um, you know, uh, systems of national importance, uh, particularly when you start looking at public sector data, heavily verticalized data, maybe healthcare data. Um, we've heard of lots of different challenges around um, you know, ransomware attacks and um, confidential data leaking out into the open. These are huge, huge concerns for businesses. So, you know, confidential data is, um, you know, really about the idea of understanding your data, understanding the um, compliance that's required around that data and protecting that data. Okay, so what makes a sovereign cloud? Um, quite simply, if you imagine a cloud in your, uh, your national boundary, um, and that cloud being owned and operated by a, uh, a national company within your, within your country. Um, this basically means that <clears throat> the ownership of the cloud is clearly aligned to that cloud provider. So the cloud provider is owning the cloud in its totality. Um, and really that means also if they have cross-border other data centers, you know, sovereign cloud needs to be contained within a region. And that becomes a challenge when you've got you know, multi-region customers. So considering sovereign cloud in those environments becomes a lot more complicated. But particularly, um, you know, having a national provider who isn't susceptible to things like Cloud Act, things like uh, foreign authority over your data and their ability to um, uh, empower uh, jurisdictional control of your data and keeping the, <clears throat> the data resident. 
that's a, a key aspect. Obviously, if your cloud provider is in your country, uh, the data centers are in your country, the data needs to be resident in your country. And here again, you know, when you look at um, hyperscale providers, it's very difficult to understand where your data is in the data center. Uh, it's very difficult to understand, you know, from the cloud provider themselves, what their DR rules are, for example. Will your data suddenly appear in a different country because the data center fell over? Um, those are things that your national cloud provider can tell you, uh, whereas getting that information from a hyperscale provider is different and often very difficult. Um, owning and operating the cloud needs to be done by sovereign citizens. Uh, and depending on the type of data you're maintaining, you would need to have citizens that are um, you know, maybe uh, security cleared, for example. Uh, again, this is really important to ask your cloud operator, where is their support? If it's 24 seven support, you often find that um, the actual support unit and support function may be outside of that territory. This means they have access to your data outside their ter your territory, and it means they're subject to separate foreign, uh, separate jurisdictional control. So also remember that when we're talking about data, we're talking about data about data, metadata. So think about your support information, your IP addresses, your um, naming conventions, all these type of things can lead to uh, challenges when you look at sovereignty. Um, and of course, Operating in your region, the cloud's got to um, comply with your local laws, your security standards, and often every region will have different types of standards there. And we're seeing an interesting problem at the moment, particularly in the EU. Um, we're labeling it as protectionism. Um, and this is where you know specific uh, countries are starting to build their own clouds with their own sets of local laws and security standards. Uh, SecNum Cloud is a great example of that in France. The challenge with that is, although it's great for France, it's going to be hard for the European Union to really overlay and mandate a legislation across multiple territories that all have individual protectionism. Um, and this is becoming more and more of a compounded issue the longer it takes to, to sort out um, the EU legislation around sovereign cloud. Okay, so as I mentioned, data is pretty much, you know, the critical aspect here, but also the infrastructure that data is running on. So data residency, um, as I explained, the services must be in region and entirely uh, run within that jurisdiction. Physical data centers must be in that region and all data at rest is stored within that data, within that jurisdiction. It doesn't, um, it doesn't, enforce any encryption on the data. Data residency is just about where the data is. And when you're thinking about data, think about the control plane. Um, you know, where are the operational support systems, the OSS, that are managing that data? Uh, is it SaaS? If it's SaaS, then it's quite possible that the SaaS platform itself is managed outside that region. Um, so think about the lo locality of the control plane and think about service dependencies. Are you dependent on any other functions that originate or are managed outside that region as well? Um, authority, this is where we get into start slightly more of the kind of legal aspects, whereas the data must be kind of subject to local legal jurisdiction. And we ask our cloud providers to attest to local capability and to ensure that they have an independent operating legal entity aligned to their, com their company. And that will then ensure that you're, you've got local legal jurisdiction uh, covered. And lastly, ownership. Um, must The infrastructure must be owned and operated by the local entity. Um, must have a local or governmental sponsor for the infrastructure. And you typically find that, um, well, particularly in the UK, we have um, a, a data center environment called ARC, uh, where we see lots of the UK public sector data being hosted. Um, and also, you know, you need to be aligned to uh, the buying process for public sector services, for example. Um, in the UK, uh, you know, you must exist on the public sector services buy sheet. Uh, and to do that, you've got to get certain numbers of um, certifications and, you know, really prove that you can manage public sector data securely. So, 
different layers to uh, to sovereignty and different layers to data and infrastructure managing that sovereignty. So what's VMware done? Um, there is no standard, first of all, let's just put this plain and simple. There is no standard around sovereign cloud. Um, VMware has conditions four basic pillars, which you can see in the, the purple um, boxes there. These are key, what we believe is key to uh, sovereignty, uh, cloud sovereignty. And interestingly enough, we were having a, uh, a sovereign cloud summit in Explore this year. And one of our, our speakers um, actually have their own kind of uh, same idea in terms of pillars and control points, levers, and actually their pillar is pretty much aligned 100% to ours, which is great. So we're showing we're on, on the right track here. Um, but basically data independence, interoperability, this is about um, you know, not having lock-in, being able to move your data, being able to simply move your data from on-prem to cloud or from cloud to cloud. Um, data security and continuous compliance, understanding your data, using the right um, levels of encryption, for example, when you have um, requirements around um, data uh, compliance and ma making sure that compliance is continuously maintained, not just a, a single point once a month check. It must be, contained, it must be continuously monitored. Um, <clears throat> and that's really important and really quite hard to do. Jurisdictional control and sovereignty, I've already explained and data access and integrity. Who has access to your data? Who's supporting your data? What is the metadata that they see? Uh, you know, when you start using um, SaaS services like ServiceNow, for example, they don't have support for sovereignty. They have support for um, data, data locality, uh, and they do do certain levels of encryption on the data, but you need to think about how that data is being presented to support and other functions for your business. Um, that's particularly important. So. We have a number of key kind of points that we ask our cloud providers, and this is critical. We ask them to self attest to supporting these key criteria. That really um, puts the legal aspect and uh, the ownership of their sovereign cloud with them. VMware is just recognizing that they've, um, you know, uh, complied to this framework. And inside the framework, um, we have our infrastructure, our common SDC platform. All sovereign cloud providers must be cloud verified, which means they've rolled out our uh, SDDC stack. And then they can provide services on top. And lots of those services come from our, our ecosystem partners like Cloudian, for example, providing object storage service within the sovereign data center. So within the sovereign boundary, you're able to innovate and provide things like object storage key management services from Fortanix, um, continuous compliance services from uh, Cavionics, uh, data protection services from Veeam, um, and so on. So there's lots of ecosystem partners that we've certified within a sovereign environment and providing key services to build out the rest of that portfolio that you need to provide to your customers. And today, obviously, we're going to be talking about some of the data services, because one of the key aspects of sovereign cloud is you must be able to innovate. You know, it's really important to recognize data is the new economy. And for that economy to flourish, you must be innovating with your data. That means things like AI, ML, data analytics, um, internet of things, whatever it might be. These all need to be uh, capabilities that you can provide in your cloud to your sovereign customers. Um, and that's particularly Guy, important. Me, me May sure, I go man. off script just, just for a moment and, and just ask, in your opinion, as, as you look at cloud or, or specifically sovereign cloud, but cloud in general, how important do you think these, these uh, bespoke services, and we're talking about data today, but these services are for not only the cloud providers, but the customers themselves? It's of huge importance. Um, put it this way, if you're... Uh, looking at cloud to provide innovation to your business, application modernization, dev ready cloud, whatever it might be. Um, cloud provides a lot of technology and use cases, particularly hyperscale cloud, that make it very convenient to, to kind of grow your business and grow your capability. If you are, let's say, contained due to your sovereign requirements, 
you need a portfolio that's going to move with you and you're not going to want to kind of use services that are non-sovereign to, to grow your business. You can't. So unless cloud providers step up and start providing services that uh, extend that cloud proposition from basic, basic infrastructure to applications to, um, you know, to workspace anywhere and things like that, then you're really going to lose that customer and you're going to have attrition in your, your cloud portfolio. Because that, that, that's one of the main reasons why people have gone to the hyperscaler cloud yeah. is because of the innovation that they've brought forward. So the analytics and the AI and the, all of those enhancements, it's not just a cost thing. So I think now we kind of are, are seeing a different, um, well, the, the, the industry moving on where everyone wants to do that, but now you have your third party vendors like, like Cloudian taking that concept of storage data management and bringing it down to the sovereign cloud or the private cloud. And I think it's exactly what you're doing with Green, Green Plum as well, right? It's sort of bringing some of that, you know, analytical um, workloads and enabling sovereign cloud to be able to deliver that in, in competition and in co 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 cooperative competition. What's the? <laughs> cooperation, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and you know, VMware can't do it all ourselves. I mean, the... I, I was in an analyst um, a meeting about two years ago, three, three years ago, pre-COVID, and they said the successful cloud providers of tomorrow are going to be those who have good partnering strategies. Um, and if you think about it, if you're using hyperscale services today to deliver your next generation applications, there's only one um, company that benefits from that, and that's the hyperscale provider because you're just feeding, feeding the engine and they'll reserve it to you back time and time again. So, you know, some people think that's a great thing. Fine. You know, I'm not going to argue that point. Um, I believe personally that we should be operating to grow our nations and our nation's interests. And part of that is delivering a, a sovereign cloud that is covering all of the ESG <laughs> principles around environment, social and governance and feeding that back to your, your nation to further your nation. Um, and also having a partner strategy so you can fill the gaps in the platform uh, and the functionality you need. And yes, VMware has got a very broad portfolio, but no, we don't do everything. Um, and, you know, we, there are situations where you can't use some of the VMware solutions because they're SaaS or and they need to be you know, in the data center, in the sovereign environment, disconnected from SaaS. And that's where having successful partnership ecosystems which I think VMware has kind of one of the best, um, but also having a, a platform that's extensible. Those are key kind of attributes that you've got to think of when you're making your cloud platform choice for our cloud providers, you know, looking at an open, extensible uh, platform that, you know, not something you build from the ground up because that's obviously a huge cost base, but something that you get 80% out of the box and the other 20, um, you maybe have to do, do yourself or do with another partner. Those are kind of some of the key principles I would look at. Okay. So, uh, so you. yeah, thanks, Guy. Um, <clears throat> so, so let me just sort of shift the narrative a little bit to data in general. And I love this quote. It's from Matt Turk at, at First Mark, um, and it's really talking about the data and AI landscape, but. You know, everyone's talked about it. Data is the new oil. Um, to succeed, every modern company will need to not just be a software company, but also a data company. I think that's clear and present. In fact, recently I've been um, interested in cooking and it feels like every advertisement across every site that I go is somehow coordinated around cooking. And I, and I think that's important to understand because organizations are making use of this data and trying to not only affect outcomes, but also make it easier for their employees, their customers, their prospects to consume um, what we have. And, and to rehash a little bit of, of what Guy had said, you know, I think the importance of services um, to uh, a cloud provider to their organizations is is really the biggest differentiator uh, between doing it themselves versus going to a cloud. 
And if a cloud provider walks in and doesn't have the same capabilities as these public clouds that we were referring to before, right? You, you need to have services around storing data. You need to have services around moving data. You need to have services around making that data accessible very quickly. And you need to have services around being able to learn and query and, and um, uh, you know, integrate all of that data. If you don't have those, you're either asking your customers to bring those to the table, to your infrastructure, or what we've seen over the last, you know, probably 10 years or so is that customers are looking towards other areas that make it easier, faster, and quicker for them to consume. So if you um, sort of look at where VMware's data vision is, and, and in transparency, uh, until some of our recent acquisitions, VMware's true data vision probably wasn't you know, completely transparent. But at the end of the day, what we're aiming to do is make data as easy to consume as we've already done for compute, for storage, for networking, for containers, and most importantly, in the hybrid cloud. Because what we see now is that you know, customers were in a quick embracement of public cloud in general. And, and again, I would say, uh, you know, the management of the infrastructure and of the, of the actual platforms themselves was super important in that decision. But we find ourselves in a hybrid cloud world, whether it's because of uh, services that we're consuming or applications we're developing and services that depend upon those um, those underlying infrastructures, we find organizations in a hybrid cloud environment, and even more so now as costs you know continue to to morph, we see a lot of customers bringing some of their known workloads even back on prem, and so having you know the ability to know that the data, the queries, the applications that I'm deploying can all access in the same manner regardless of where I deploy is actually super important to, to folks. And so one of the, the core tenants that we're really um, centered around is around providing open source data solutions that are curated for the enterprise, that are hardened, and that work well in a multi-cloud infrastructure. And what does that really mean at the end of the day? We take advantage of whatever infrastructure that you deploy us underneath on. And so, you know, we'll, uh, st we'll essentially um, uh, design, proof, and, and configure our products in order to work on, you know, super fast infrastructure, medium fast infrastructure, and, you know, more edge infrastructure in order to make the maximum usage of that infrastructure and really get to an end um, use case that uh, customers are looking for. And why did we center upon open source? Well, if you actually look at what's been going on over the last you know, 10 years or so, open source usage, open source uh, commercialization of database products has now finally eclipsed those of commercial. And you, know, you could uh, attribute that to a number of reasons. You know, I think the popularity of you know, decoupling these monolith applications into microservices has definitely paved the way. Instead of having one big giant Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server database, instead what you see is for a given application, you know, if you have 20 microservices powering that application, you'll see 20 smaller but um, very focused data infrastructures powering those microservices. And because they're smaller and because they're more purpose built, there's less of a reticence to use open source technologies. You combine that with the new workforce that's coming out of universities and, and whatnot, they're not learning on proprietary commercial data products. They're learning on open source data products that quite frankly, in this day and age, have had the same level of R&D um, support and, and hours, uh, you know, human hours put into them of their commercial alternatives that they're as good, 
if not better than those alternatives. And so there's a huge trend uh, in the popularity of open source. And, um, you know, we're taking those open source projects. In a lot of cases, we're driving them ourselves together with the community. And then, you know, again, making sure that they're really ready for the enterprise, making it easy for uh, our cloud uh, partners to be able to deploy and operationalize on behalf of their customers. And why are we doing that? You know, at the end of the day, we're trying to help in this evolution of, of overall data architecture and, and really, you know, really, uh, I'll say coining the term delivering on the promise of data for the organization. So a lot of the customers that I talk to a lot are in this bottom cloud area, if you will, of this mono horrific wasteland. And as customers, you know, kind of modernize, they can evolve on how they use data. And the more agile they are, the more value they can get out of data. And so if you think about the last 30 years, you know, traditionally we've done a lot of integration to take that wasteland of data and kind of bring it together in a single source of truth that the organization can use. But unfortunately, as you kind of step up the pyramid, you know, at the bottom of the period yet of the pyramid, you have this traditional way of, of looking at data. It tends to um, manifest itself in this reactive way. Oh, I've got all of my data sales in my data warehouse. Let me see how we performed last week. That's good to know, and it can drive future decisions. But as you become more agile, you can make more use of the value of that data and start to become more proactive. And so instead of waiting for the data to actually get into the data warehouse, can we get to a spot where we can be event-driven? As something happens, can I do something, whether it's provide an extra discount, provide a value-added service, provide a value-added product? And so we try to be a little bit more proactive, knowing what's going on in the ecosystem of our customers, of our employees. But even that isn't enough, right? So as we continue to become more agile, let's see if we can be more predictive. Instead of waiting for Jacques to step up to the cash register and, and say, I'd like to buy some pasta. Let's say that I've, I've discovered that Jacques is looking at pasta. Let's give him a discount immediately on some store made um, pasta sauce, for example. Let's be predictive. If he's buying pasta, he probably needs some sauce. Let's make it enticing for him to buy it. But even that isn't enough as you become more and more agile. Let's be a little bit more prescriptive and give Jacques the idea that instead of just coming to the store and buying pasta and maybe buying pasta sauce, maybe we can actually give Jacques a recipe where he comes to the store and buys mushrooms and tomatoes and onions and everything else and, and actually give him an idea that he hasn't even had yet, right? And, and so again, as we become more agile and become more um, attuned to the data that, we, that we're getting, we can become preemptive and sort of influence what our users are actually looking to get to. And not in obviously a, a maniacal or, or nefarious way, but in a way that actually adds value to their overall end goal from the get-go before they even realize it. And so that's what we're trying to provide. And, and that's what a lot of these services really are trying to provide. And so I said it, you know, kind of before, but, you know, what VMware is trying to do, and we're trying to do it with that ecosystem of partners, you know, in this uh, scenario specifically, we're talking about Greenplum and Cloudian. We're trying to deliver on this promise of data. And, and you know, the VMware data solutions actually transcend beyond just this massively parallel shared nothing um, open source data warehouse in Greenplum. It, it goes beyond that. It's really across a portfolio of data products that really embody these three you know, tenets, embracing performance, ensuring the freedom of scale, and that means from the smallest amount of data to the largest amount, right? And really being able to deploy anywhere. You know, we see customers today that are looking for sovereign cloud. I want to make sure that all of my data stuff is here in this country. But we also know that some customers need to be able to continue working with that data and working with those platforms on premise, sometimes virtually, sometimes bare metal. But regardless of where it is, 
being able to assure them that the same queries, the same, you know, kinds of machine learning that they're deploying on premise will work anywhere that they deploy. That actually takes out a, a huge burden for support and management and operations and, and, and really everything. Right. And so, you know, if you come back to the performance side, you know, we want to be able to not only capture data as it's being created, we want to process and curate it. We want to be able to serve it with, you know, lightning speed. Essentially, you know, we're looking at the, the fastest, you know, sub-second kinds of uh, response time. And we need to drive that value out of um, the largest of data and be able to correlate that with a lot of other data sets. We want to be able to provide it at self-service, right? So we don't want the traditional user or developer to have to submit a ticket to an organization and wait for a process in order to begin adding value to the organization. Instead, what we want is a cloud-like experience. We want to be able to step up and say, hey, I want to get going right away. We don't want anything you know, blocking us. We don't want to have to wait. We want to get going right away. And we want to be able to get going at any scale. And so we leverage, um, in this case, we're, we're really leveraging open source Postgres-based software. Postgres has uh, been in uh, open source development for literally over 30 years. Um, and it provides this ongoing innovation. If you look at the sort of the market, Postgres adoption has uh, ballooned over the last four or five years. Um, every new technology is really basing access in with a Postgres compatible library. It is, it is clearly one of the um, leading indicators of what kind of compatibility um, developers are looking for. And we want to aggregate it and we want to get all kinds of data, whether it's structured or unstructured, all together and scale it so that we can really make use of it. Um, and then continue to respond to the needs of the organization, again, whether it's on-premise, in the public cloud, in a sovereign cloud, et cetera. Um, you know, I think at this stage of the game, if you're still listening to us, you're saying, ah, that sounds great, but you know, what is Greenplum? You know, I mentioned it before, Greenplum is this scalable, massively parallel Postgres with a bunch of extra features. What does massively parallel mean? You know, I used to give this example, um, it's been uh, known in the industry now for probably 20 years or so, but you know, imagine a scenario where you know, the four of us were in a room and I asked each of us, you know, to count how many jacks were in a deck of cards that I happened to have in my pocket. You know, if I handed it out to the guy who was just speaking, you know, he would be forced to flip through 52 cards in order to understand whether or not, you know, there was, you know, four jacks in the deck, 12 jacks in the deck, 10 jacks in the deck. That takes a, a set amount of time. However, if I was to deal that deck of cards out to the four of us, now all of a sudden Guy only has 13 cards to count through. And so he's counting through his cards and he counts how many jacks and gives that back to me who aggregates all of that together. While he's doing that, the rest of us are also counting our cards. And because we've split the 52 cards into four sets of 13, we are now able to count how many jacks are in the deck four times faster than we were before. And that's really the power of parallelism. We make the use of more and more um, uh, things in order to like answer queries. Um, and so what are those things and what do they do? You know, we offer all these standard data warehouse features, right? So whether you wanna connect BI and analytics, um, you know, and think like Tableau and, and you know, Looker and those kinds of, of things to the database. What Greenplum effectively looks like is a, a large parallel Postgres database or said it differently, a very large Postgres database. We're 100% SQL compatible, but we also have the ability to run Python, R, Java, Perl, et cetera, and not only run those functions, but run them right next to the data in parallel 
And so you can literally take your Python libraries and throw them up next to the data and really actually leverage the power of this massive compute engine. Greenplum has the ability to structure its data either row oriented or column oriented and has the ability to understand both structured and semi-structured like JSON, for example, within the database itself and actually query that within native SQL. We're 100% Postgres compatible and because we're parallel, it's super fast to query and ingest data really faster than probably anything that you could possibly have seen before. Um, and because we have so much compute, because we continue to scale horizontally, we have this massive compute grid, which is why Python runs so nicely in it. And then we've added on top of these normal data warehouse features, we've added a bunch of extra features, including deep learning, including machine learning, time series graph, et cetera. And for the enterprise, we allow for streaming ingested data straight into the tables geospatial um, analysis, as well as uh, integration with a lot of common things like Spark and NiFi and Kafka, et cetera, text analytics, OCR, you know, really everything that you could imagine for deep level analysis, but in one platform so that you don't have to have constant data movement and um, uh, data wrangling. And so if you look at it kind of at, at the higher level, you have a bunch of data sources. We leverage ETL and ELT to stream that data into this engine in the middle of Greenplum. Combined with Cloudian, you can actually get the best ROI because data that you need immediately can be stored within Greenplum, within um, uh, attached storage of some sort, and then externally still access um, a lot of your historical data, a lot of your non-loaded data, in an object store like Cloudian. And you can perform all of these typical business user data analyst, uh, data scientist type activities, SQL, R, et cetera, leveraging all the functions that you see in the data science box, and then also leveraging all the visualization tools that are available in the ecosystem itself. And that really kind of sets the stage for this unified data infrastructure 2.0, where you've got sources and all of these different things, but in the middle, you know, it has been coined that there's this need for a, not a data warehouse, not a data lake, but really more of this data lake house. And within that lake house, you've got everything from the lake to a query engine, et cetera. If you look at the combination of where all this data is going from the sources, from ingestion, et cetera, you're still using a lot of these platforms and whatnot. And so, you know, from a Greenplum Cloudian standpoint, our ability to simplify and really say that Cloudian can be that data lake and Greenplum can actually, you know, sit on top of it and provide a SQL engine, a machine learning platform, a real-time analytics database, and a data warehouse. That makes it easier for your users, your developers, your overall architecture, and even the operations from the cloud um, providers themselves you know, that makes things um, so much easier and so much more compatible to the original sources, knowing that Greenplum itself is based off of Postgres. And so with that, I kind of want to turn it over to Neil and, and, and let him talk a little bit more about Cloudy in itself. Hey, Jack, just before we, we go over to, um, to Neil, sorry, Neil. <laughs> um, just a quick question. Uh, for our cloud partners who are watching this, um, you've obviously got today Cloudian, which is integrated with Cloud Director um, and provides object storage service, storage buckets, object immutability, all sorts of nice, cool stuff. Um, that is a multi-tenant environment. So you can slice and dice your object storage in, by your Cloud Director tenants. For Greenplum, what is the, um, the cloud operating model that a cloud provider would look like it looks to me like it would be an instance per tenant um, and then can connect to the shared Cloudian data store. Would that be a correct assumption? That would be a correct assumption. It would actually mirror what um, organizations like Amazon is doing with Redshift, which arguably is a, um, a competitor to Greenplum. Right. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's all I have. Yeah. No. Great. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Wolf. Um, so, so guys kind of talked about 
um, Sovereign Cloud and about how we can manage our, um, you know, infrastructure. You know, Jack took this, the the story on one one next level, which was really about how to make how to how to extract more value out of our raw data. So so now really I'm here to talk a little bit about where where is that raw data um, going to be stored? How, how are we going to manage that? How do we protect that? So so Cloudy and um, Hyperstore. Um, it was kind of born in the cloud. Um, we wanted to do something um, uh, very similar to, to how AWS was offering a, a cloud storage. And an object storage really is, um, it's been around for a little while, but it's really been popularized um, in the cloud because it is very much API driven. So you access it via APIs rather than traditional um, you know, file and block storage protocols. So it's very much aimed at um, unstructured data rather than structured data. But if, as, as you know, we've been talking today, I think it's now 90, 95% of the, the data in this world is, is unstructured. And if we think about what unstructured data is, it's, it's data that's, you know, coming from everywhere. It's, it's coming from your phone, it's coming from IoT devices, it's coming from CCTV cameras, sensors, it's log files, it's streaming data i mean it, it could be literally anything coming from anywhere so how do we sort of aggregate all of that data and then turn it into something that's valuable and how do we get you know one data source and another data source and another data source get that data analyze that data and actually turn you know that into something really valuable for an organization to do something with so we, we need the, all of this data to go somewhere um we we pretty much the most scalable Storage platform you can get on the market. Object storage is is one of the key. That's one of the key design tenants. It's about scale, you know. So we can grow to, I think now a couple of exabytes. We can address a couple of exabytes of of storage space of data. Um, it needs to be protected, you know. It needs to be, you know. You need to guarantee that it's, it's going to be secure. So we've spent a lot of time looking at the security and and one part of that is the ransomware piece protecting against ransomware so we have the object lock capability that allows you to make your data immutable um so it can't be changed therefore it is immune to um, ransomware and of course we need to be compatible with the cloud <clears throat> you know data is moving everywhere so your data is created and stored, you know, in the cloud or on the edge or, you know, in your own data center. We need a common platform, a common, you know, way of accessing our data that um, allows you to access data that might be in the cloud, might be on-premise, might be sovereign cloud, you know. So this is where the something like the S3 API comes into play, where that is a common um framework for you to access and use your data and actually be able to move your data around but also get very very granular control over you know what your data is so um perfect lead on um it's, it's just you know cloudy and hyperstore really has the um you know the s3 api came out of amazon's s3 storage public storage service and how to access the data there and manage the data there so we took that concept, we took that API, and we kind of put it into a storage platform that can be deployed in, in the cloud, it can be deployed in sovereign cloud, it can be deployed on, on premise. So you, you can basically build a cluster out that goes across any of the infrastructure um, pieces that you need to use. But we also have that control, especially for sovereign cloud or data that needs to be in a sovereign cloud. We have the control to say, okay, your infrastructure may be built out of, you know, um, hyperscale, a public cloud, sovereign cloud, and private cloud. But we can say for this particular data set, you know, it can only be stored in a sovereign cloud or private cloud, and it can only have access from certain um, certain users or certain applications. So we get very, very um, multi-tenant capable very quickly, and that's because we did design our platform to um, to be delivered as a as a, as a you know storage as a service um, platform so well that's all, all great um we can get data access from anywhere we can store it anywhere but we also need to be able to see where it is we need to be able to manage it and we need to be able to control uh, or manage the control of that as well so we we also do that right across you know the um, all different types of cloud if you like 
we also need to make this very very simple we need it need need to make data easy to consume so the s3 api makes it easy for applications and users to get access to but we need to make it easy to scale so we need to make it easy to scale you know whether it's you just need to store more data or you need to go into new locations or you need to have a hybrid cloud uh you know infrastructure and you also need to decide how am i going to run this do i want, want to run this in containers on bare metal servers in virtual machines or in virtual machines in the public cloud so so we built our platform very much with this in mind so we basically have a concept of nodes a storage node and you can just keep on adding storage nodes and that storage node could be running on a container it could be running you know on a virtual machine it could be running in VM vmware in your in your data center and that could be part of the same storage cluster that's running in uh let's say running in amazon or running in your london new york la data center and have a single you know single management point for all of your data we, we can we do away with the silos of data now um, that you've had from traditional um, you know storage platforms. Um, so really, we're just trying to make it as easy as possible um, to build out this this data lake, and it doesn't have to be you know in one location. It could literally be be, be anywhere. So when we talk about security, you know this is so important. Um, it's not just from a you know a compliance or regulation point of view. But it's, it's, it's about data protection. How many copies of our data do we have? Do we have disaster recovery? Do we have business continuity capabilities? Ransomware is seen as one of the major threats to all organizations you know, all around the world. I think it was number two uh, global threat in the, the World Economic Forum. Um, they had like the top, top five. That includes items such as you know, climate control, war, um, you know, civil uh, unrest. Ransomware was number two, um, you know, kind of kind of really, really scary. And we often say it's a case of when you're going to get attacked by ransomware rather than if. So what we have is something called data immutability that, that uh, you know, once we've got the ingested the data, we can make that data immutable, which means it cannot be changed. And if it cannot be changed, then ransomware cannot come in and encrypt that data, um, you know, and, and take away the control from you so it's absolutely tamper proof we've worked very hard to make sure that our platform is secure so even if you know there's a possibility of over overriding the immutability controls we've absolutely locked down we've got no root access you know we've got a very secure shell where you can cannot get access to any operating system commands or or any higher level you know um administration accounts that would allow you to make that change it really genuinely is locked down and we've, we've proved that in a number of um third party reviews so that we are um you know we can say that we're sec 17a um, compatible which really is that's something to do with finance regulation around finance which means that you need to be able to prove that your digital asset it's, it's almost like a, a you know it's like a piece of paper you know, you can see if someone has crossed out some day, um, some some words on a piece of paper and changed it. So it's it's almost accepted in a court of law that this data, you know, ha has not been changed. So we have the security to sort of surround that. But then you also need to think about, well, okay, that's great. I, I'm protecting my data against immutability, or sorry, against ransomware and, and it being changed. What about data theft? So we can we can bring in data encryption down at the base data level. So even if someone does steal your data, it is encrypted only you have the keys to get access to that and of course you know we want <clears throat> many people to access our data and, and i was <clears throat> presenting at a security cyber security conference um just last week you know the most secure data is where you give it access to nobody if you give your data if no nobody's got access to your data it's, it's pretty secure the challenge is that to make use of your data you know, we want lots of people to access it, lots of process to access it. So then being able to offer that security and protection of your data access within a, a, a multi-tenancy environment becomes really important. So we can do that. We can, we've got very granular controls over who can do what, who can see what, and you know how that can be used. So working, we've been working with VMware for um, quite a number of years now. And you know VMware are constantly evolving their um, you know their portfolio of services. So we've, we've been uh, we initially started out with VMware Cloud Director. So 
the ability to orchestrate the storage alongside your other infrastructure components like your compute and your networking. And then over time, you know, we've expanded to bring in more of the infrastructure control, more of the monitoring uh, reports, all from within the sort of the single, um, you know, pane of glass management that VMware provide. But then now, you know, we're, we're working with the likes of Valero and Greenplum to bring in these extra, you know, um, data services that allow you to extract more value out of out of that raw data that we're storing for you. And really, we're starting to get into the world of, you know, data analytics, um, you know, HDFS offload. So replacing out um, traditional big data um, architectures, which, you know, now are becoming a little bit long in the tooth. Um, you know, and Green Plumber kind of moving that that piece, you know, a lot further forward with innovation and flexibility around, you know, different different aspects of um, the environment that can that can consume that data. And of course, we've got to do the basic stuff as well, like the data protection, the disaster recovery, the business continuity. So this data that is so important to your business now, you know, it, it, it becomes even more important to protect it. So we have all of this built in, um, you know, to provide that base for the, you know, the extra value on, on top. So just as, a, you know, a, a quick look here is, um, you know, the data lake view with Greenplum and, and Cloudian. And of course, this could all be running on a, a nice, you know, VMware virtual machine environment. Um, so basically, you can scale out the green plum environment as, as much as you need. Keep on adding more nodes so that you get that more, you get more analytical power. But at the same time, you can grow the storage independently. If you need more data storage, then you can add more into Cloudian online, you know, no disruption, and we can keep on growing into the exabyte world. Um, but if you need just more analytic horsepower, you can just grow that bit. It is, you know, it's 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 independently managed. So it's uh, uh, hyper converged was always a uh, um, you know big thing. I, I came up with a phrase last night in my sleep: hyper diver diverged. I don't know if that's ever going to catch on, but um, we'll see. So you know where are we going? Just as a quick summary, you know. You know, object storage is very, very powerful in terms of, you know, um, easy access to your data, huge scalability. And because everybody now is standardizing on the S3 protocol, it gives us such a wide range of, of use cases. So, but why would you run? So, you know, this, this has been popularized in the, in the hyperscaler cloud for a long time, but why would you run this on premise now? Well, I think many organizations are beginning to understand that there's a, there's a huge cost associated with running in, in the public cloud. And a lot of the innovation has now been moving down out of the cloud, you know, into, um, you know, sovereign clouds, into private clouds. And you've got this idea of data gravity where your data set has become so large, you can't move exabytes of data or petabytes of data or even terabytes of data as hard. So actually, would it be easier to move your application closer to the data? And I think you've, you've kind of got data gravity and in a way application gravity and you kind of got to where, you know, the, the best option, um, you know, w whatever you're running. And of course, you know, we do all of this with the sort of data protection and treat the applications as if they are business critical, which of course, you know, any data application is becoming super business critical right now. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I wanted to thank all of you, Neil, Jacques, and Guy, for the great presentations. Unfortunately, we do not have any time for your personal questions. We will reach out to you and answer them on an individual base. So um, if you have any questions, go directly to our website, cloudian.com slash greenplum, or directly go to our um, contact person, Neil, um, Jacques, or um, Guy on that end. We also have a general email address, vmware at